Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It is a, a real pleasure to be here again. And uh, I will speak uh, in English, as I said. I will speak uh, slowly. I hope I am understood. Um, and our American guests, I hope that my accent is legible. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be in uh, this part of the Iberian Peninsula. And I'd just like to say that we uh, in Grafton Architects are always truly impressed by the quality and depth of the thinking uh, by the architects of this area. Uh, it is not just me saying this standing here, but uh, the, the level of uh, consistent, deep thought, the level of consistent, uh, clear building is inspirational. And I think that uh, we have to be reminded very often of how much work has been done and how much work of quality is here. So thank you on behalf of other architects that uh, when there is a struggle, Ireland has been very badly hit since 2008 uh, by the famous crisis, but we are now moving out of that, we hope. And we hope that, uh, that, that the rest of Europe uh, continues to build and that you continue to build at the level and standard which is, uh, is, is truly inspiring. So first of all, I'd like to, on behalf of Grafton Architects, myself and Shelley I.M. Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara began our practice in 1978. So we have been uh, teaching and building over quite a long time. It doesn't get any easier, but it gets uh, and continues to be very interesting. And uh, we would also like to thank you for asking us to exhibit some of our work here in the foyer of the uh, of the university, and that maybe in the School of Architecture, when you have time, that you might read each of the, of the panels uh, independently. So really what, for there are 11 examples of our work uh, outside the door, but today I'll discuss four of those projects. And there are three universities and one uh, office for a government department. I'll begin by saying, as architects, we imagine on behalf of others. We find meaning, I mean all architects uh, find meaning, and we interpret dreams and wishes. We transform need w using materials like concrete, uh, chepo, limestone, or brick. And we, I suppose, see architecture as a silent uh, language that speaks that we are translators of need into built work, that we make the silent language of space. And for us, architecture transforms place and culture. And particularly, I suppose we would say that we are interested in the language of place, that architects' civic role is to claim place to claim each particular coordinate <coughs> on this fragile planet and to emphasize and highlight what is specific in geographical, climatic, and cultural terms. We are based in Dublin, the capital of the Republic of Ireland, and our oral tradition, our delight in story, in metaphor, in playing with language, with the English language particularly, uh, encourage us, us to dig deeply to uncover the potential story within each new project and to find the hidden dream, the unspoken wish, and to listen to what is being said and sometimes to listen to what is not being said. I'll just begin. We use these two images. One on the left-hand side, this is of carved limestone. It's in a place called the Burren in the west of Ireland. It is an amazing landscape, like a lunar landscape. And we use the other image here, this beautiful pavilion by Sverfen, the Nordic pavilion in Venice. We use them to remind ourselves of two worlds, 
that we inhabit as architects, the real and the imagined. The real is about place and materials and culture, experience, the path of the sun, changing uh, seasons, people and use. And the real world is anchored in things that remain true, things that have stood the test of time. The imagined world, on the other hand, is anchored in architectural memory, in new ideas, in new experiences and new influences. And sometimes it's a conversation that changes the way we look at the world. We use the word conversations because a really important conversation between Louis Barrigan and Louis Kahn, when Kahn was making the space in California, in La Jolla, for the, uh, for the um, uh, Salk Institute, thank you. Just wondering whether you're listening. The Salk Institute, <laughs> that Kahn originally was going to landscape that space. And through a conversation, uh, Barrigan, uh, if you like, discussed the whole uh, idea of the kind of empty space, the void, the space. I had a very interesting conversation with a tutor in the professor in the, in the first year this morning, just about how in first year you're developing an understanding of space on its own. And we often quote Alejandro de la Sota when he says, architects should make as much nothing as possible that we're actually in the void, we are in the space. So conversations in terms of the imagined worlds are very important. How you develop yourselves as students, the conversations you have with your colleagues will last a lifetime. Shelley McNamara and I were students together in the University College Dublin, and we continue the architectural conversation many, many years later. In terms of languages, there are approximately 7,000 languages in the world uh, today, but they disappear. One disappears about every 14 days. Some of the languages, about 2,000 of them, only have about 1,000 speakers. So as, they, as languages vanish, we lose centuries of thinking about time, seasons, and landscapes, myths and music, the unknown and the everyday, and as things change, architecture becomes even more responsible for anchoring and animating social values. So today, we are totally immersed in architecture in the language and the consequences of uh, architecture. So you students are highly privileged to be here with your distinguished professors studying this amazing uh, discipline to make the world uh, of the future. So as I said today, there are 11 examples outside of our work, but today I'll talk about four projects, one in Italy, uh, two in Ireland, and one in Peru. Just make sure I'm going the right way, or the wrong way. The first one is our project, which was built in, uh, in Milan uh, in for the University uh, of Bocconi. And the, the site, uh, which is, this is the center of Milan, moving down from the Duomo, if you walk 20 minutes, roughly, to what's known as the Spanish Walls. You're obviously in lots of places of the world. And the site is outside uh, the Spanish Walls here, the, the university. So we came to this uh, competition. And the competition for students and the discussion this morning about sketching and drawing, the humble pencil, this, this element here, is really the powerful tool uh, of architects. This and your notebook is really where um, ideas can begin and ideas can survive. And the nature of uh, architectural building is really that the concept, the DNA, the totality of the building, this embryo, that the task of architects is really that this uh, useful tool survives the enormous process of the building industry. So this is a sketch which describes the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the brief was for a thousand, a thousand offices. Now offices tend to be a certain size, corridors tend to be a certain size, so that we felt that with a thousand offices, the choice was either that you make a, um, a, an office block or that you're able to transform this need for a thousand offices into something new. So what we did was we conceived of the offices as bars of space, 
and we thought about them as solid. So these sketches represent the bars of space of offices, presumably with corridors in the middle, and, and each office would have a window, and that this would be elevated like a, an, an attic space that had voids that allowed light to come through. So these are the diagrams for the sun to reach through to make these small courtyards. The other issue of the competition was that each element, the big aula mania for a thousand people, and uh, a number of conference uh, spaces for another 1,500 people would be below ground. And we questioned that and said that we would like to uh, get as much daylight to these spaces as possible. So what we did was we asked the question, is it possible that, oh, excuse me, that is it possible that these, uh, the lower elements of spaces could be like a corrupted groundscape? So the power in this sketch, this uh, piece of uh, charcoal pencil on paper, is really uh, the, the beginning of the, the making of a project. And I suppose for us, the test of these kind of diagrams in the, in the huge effort from client to costing to contractors right through to building is whether this sensation of the two spaces, when you uh, stand in the space of the Coney, as you walk from the city through, that you get a sense of the sky and you get a sense of the carved ground. So the, when we use the term architects as translator, we're really saying that we're translating need into, we now discuss it, I suppose, to do with the new geography, that you're actually making uh, new ground. When we go to Milan, Milan is, a, is an amazing city. It was very, very damaged after the Second World War which actually was amazing for the architects because they had so much to do. Uh, we're not supporting that as a, as a proposition, but it is amazing to go through Milan and to see the power of invention uh, where people had to begin, literally had to begin again. But what is beautiful about Milan is that it has these incredible range of stones and beautiful ways of dealing with uh, uh, anchoring, just taking the water away. So you have this incredible stone carpet, as we described, this city, which is now being damaged, I suppose. They're digging up a lot of this uh, for just using uh, tarmac on the roads, but there are still beautiful sandstone, diagonal stones uh, on, on the ground. So for us, in terms of the competition, for uh, students who, who may not know the, the project, the, um, the, the, the position is really off a very busy road, a quiet road. Uh, it connects to an existing uh, campus, which is embedded in the city with freestanding buildings, and that we wanted to connect and continue the city floor. So what we're doing here is very busy road, quieter road. We're bringing the entry to the quieter part. We delay the access into the, the, the hall for the professors. We make routes through for the students to continue to their other uh, buildings in the campus. We bring you through and we bring you down. So this staircase brings you to a foyer and this foyer is five meters below the city. And we make this window, which is eight meters high, which both connects and separates both in sections. So this is five meters below, and this is the city. And we make a small uh, uh, civic space <coughs> in terms of the city. The positioning of the Aula Mania for 1,000 people, this has roughly uh, 12 uh, by 15, I think, in terms of numbers. So you can gauge the size of this room and the size of a room for uh, a 1,000 people. And we positioned this large, the largest room of this uh, project uh, at the junction between the busy city and the campus itself. So we, we placed this nugget uh, at, that, at that junction. In terms of structure, we uh, positioned these, which I'll show you them uh, shortly, every 25 meters, we made these large structures, which in fact uh, give you a scale in terms of the city. So you can gauge we have five, essentially five uh, spaces as they march down. This is from the competition. And one of the things that we wanted to achieve in the, in the making of the building is that as you entered from the city and moved into the campus, that the offices would not be sitting, if you like, on normal structure, but that the soffits of the offices would be modified to change the kind of space and scale of space. So this is from the competition. This is a, a wish to modify these, uh, the, uh, the courtyards so that the soffits are modified. So here we have the city, 
five meters below nine meters, and we have these routes where students can uh, move down in through the, into the campus. We're also fascinated by structure. Uh, this is an amazing image by the uh, uh, Italian architect who moved to South America, Lino Bobardi. And this structure, which it allows a space to be made under here, which is open to the, uh, to the public. And we, we th I suppose one of the most important things, and I think it's very strong in the culture of the school here, is the relationship between structure and space and how you make a building, that it's not paper architecture, that the sense of structure is, r is really clear. And for us then, the first moves um, uh, in doing the competition was to say, if we want this idea of the modified soffits, how do we achieve that? So we, this drawing here is really very important. We said that we would put the main beams on the upper level and that we would hang the offices down below. So these are, if you like, metal threads which allow us to modify and to sculpture the floor. And these are, uh, at one level, humble uh, models. This is a 1 is to uh, 500 uh, cardboard model showing you the twin structure. So every 25 meters, we have these twin. Uh, there are 3.6 meters uh, wide uh, diaphragm walls which move down the site. We have the busy street, the quiet street, what was to be the library here, and we have these courts which bring light down through the structure. And this plan with the X's shows where the, uh, the voids uh, might be in terms of like an abacus that you make solid and void to, to, to link them. And this sketch is really an aspirational sketch which shows the, the soffits being modified and light uh, coming through. This is probably a bit uh, light in terms of the, of the drawing, but essentially this is the uh, beginning of the construction drawing, the busy street, the corridors, the voids, the, uh, the offices themselves. And in terms of section, we can see that we have the, the main beams which are here on the upper levels and hanging from them at different uh, dimensions uh, are the offices. And sometimes we have a hanging garden, sometimes a clear story light, sometimes the light is tumbling down. And what we've discovered as architects is that light bounces and light tumbles. So if this is the street level, minus five, minus nine, with the parking and technical floors uh, be below the city. So here we have the uh, diaphragm walls marching uh, across the site. The site begins with these being built. We have the, sorry, the structure being placed on top. So these are the, these are the beams placed on these walls. They arrive. They hang, so in, in terms of these are the rods from which the, uh, the plates for the offices will be secured. And this is the, the, uh, the um, scaffolding to hold the surface of the aula. The aula is a 22 meter uh, cantilever which springs from here. And this is it being, uh, this is the space before it happens. And the, the power of drawing, this is, these are two pencil sketches, both in uh, uh, charcoal and pencil and, and colored pencil, where the, the two issues of this project lie. This is the city context where Milan is very interesting because Milan is a North uh, Italian city, but was very influenced by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And what you feel is that you feel that, that, that it has this kind of outer, uh, crust, people are kind of formal, but behind all that is a very soft and friendly, they're more uh, restrained as a, as a type of people. And we wanted to, uh, to make a project in this uh, rational city which was able to pick up on the character of that place. And this is really a drawing saying we will make the outer crust uh, which holds the city uh, edge, but we'll make the inner crust where you have the thousand offices for the professors, that each professor would be given a, a room, would be given a window that has fresh air, and would be given a view into a courtyard. So the issue of, uh, so these drawings were the, the initial studies, and this is a view of the built courtyard, where you're looking up, these are the, uh, the hanging, we're looking up towards the sky here, and this is the, these are the shingles of glass, which uh, are, uh, uh, contain the, the, uh, the offices, and on the outside, we chose to use a very ordinary stone of Milan, which is called Chepo. 
And Milan is full of beautiful stones. So the, when we chose this very ordinary, everyday stone, the client was surprised because it is normally associated with the ordinary. But what we felt was that the amazing thing about Cepo is that the tradition built in, uh, in Milan is that it has no joints. Architects spend their lives wondering about the size of a joint. We're saying it's very, this is the kind of sad future all you students have. You're going to worry about whether it's that size, whether it's this size. You know, the architect who made this space worried about this size, whether it's a recess joint. So these kind of physicalities, these judgments, really are part of your uh, repertoire for now and for the future. So we worried about what the material would be, and Cepo is made in Milan with absolutely no joints. It's down to uh, three uh, millimeters, even less, and it's actually stuck onto the structure. So we were fascinated by this, and we felt that this material could give us the monumentality and the monolithic character that we were looking for in our building. So you can see here that the, the, this chepo is actually uh, butt jointed. It doesn't have a it doesn't have a, uh, um, a a mortar joint, and it allowed us then to make these great walls, which were like cliffs within the city, to protect against the sun, but also to give uh, a, a reading of the building of enclosure uh, on the outside. And then the opposite to that, which is the section, this is the what you saw a few minutes ago with the 22 meters. This is the cantilever of the upper part of the Aula Magna. And this cantilever is 22 meters beyond its base, and it goes from inside to outside. And this is eight meters high of clear glass, as I said, do doing two things. One, it uh, allows this space to be lit from above, but it means that you can have uh, a window to the city. We have the chepo above, and as we went deeper into the ground, we changed from chepo, which is this gray geological stone that looks like concrete, to a really beautiful stone called Bianca Laza. So Bianca Laza is this highly reflective uh, white, uh, white stone. So as we went down into the earth, we changed from the uh, chepo and we brought this really beautiful surface to bring light deeper and deeper uh, into, into the project. The social issue, there's a, there's a, a, a beautiful, um, this image for us is really important and there was a beautiful photograph, I don't have it today, of parents uh, standing here looking down at their children because there was an exhibition of children's art, but the children weren't allowed to bring their parents into the exhibition, it was only for children. But you had you know, hundreds of adoring parents standing up here viewing in. So the, the issue of section, there's a, what I'm struck by the beautiful drawings and the fantastic publications that you have in this university is the issue of the section. The section is in fact the way as architects we orchestrate space the plan and the section, but the section is the point, is the void in which we inhabit. And for us, the social relationship between the city of Milan watching uh, trams going by by people here, but also then that the citizen can see what the university does. So this connection and interplay, this social connection, is something that we find uh, very important uh, in architecture and for us is an important ingredient. And in terms of structure, this is the 25 meter span. This is the city up here, five meters below, nine meters below. So you get this new life and new light uh, uh, below the city. When we started doing the competition, we were a bit disappointed because, I mean, Florence is beautiful and Rome is powerful, but Milan is a working city and not what you call, this is it during a foggy day, this is the site. Uh, and we were, you know, it's an ordinary piece of Milan. And we imagined it, this is a, a pencil drawing and collage set into this uh, photocopy showing what the project would be. And there is the uh, eight meter high uh, uh, screen to the city. And also in terms of night, that the citizen in Milan would actually have some relationship to this project uh, on their way home, that it would register in people's minds as a gift to the city, as a, as a type of lantern. So here is that eight meter high uh, clear glass, this is the 22 meter cantilever projecting and the space continues with the structure beyond. The, 
the projects, these next uh, projects are projects based in, uh, in Dublin. This is a, 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 a project we were asked to build for the Department uh, of Finance in a very different uh, uh, condition. Dublin, this part of Dublin is, uh, this is a medieval uh, uh, space called St. Stephen's Green and this is a, a beautiful 18th century space called uh, Merrion Square. And what's amazing about these uh, squares is that they're essentially made of the surfaces of these individual houses. You can see the kind of remnants of the gardens behind, but these houses form a grand room. So this is in fact a public room, which is now a public park. And our site is this red piece here between two spaces, this uh, medieval space and this 18th century space. And these are government, uh, government buildings. So our project was to weave into this context of 18th century Dublin on the cusp between the 18th century and the medieval. And in the medieval uh, space of Stephen's Green, a lot of the contemporary buildings have jump scale, have become much, much bigger. And we uh, developed a project where as the 18th century, this red brick, as the site was here, as we came from the uh, 18th century, that we would modify our building to become uh, the larger scale. And this pencil drawing here is beginning to uh, discuss uh, that we might use a stone building, uh, a, st a stone composition for this building, and not brick. In Dublin, the tradition is that uh, major public buildings are in stone and the ordinary buildings are in brick. And we argued that the, the Department of Finance, much as we might have different views about that government department, but that it does there, it, it is a, a public, has a public function. So we uh, began to research uh, the, the issue of scale, of streetscape, of uh, changing the scale from the, uh, the four-story here to the higher uh, of St. Stephen's Green. And in terms of plan, what we did was that on the left-hand side to the, to the west of our site, this is the site here, it had two conditions, an existing building, which we demolished, and a 1912 uh, building, a linear building, which was of the arts and crafts area, a very beautiful building which was protected by law. So this building is protected. The site here had a um, kind of a mediocre uh, red brick four-story building here. And here protected by law is one of the last and probably the last European um, uh, burial place for Huguenots. Huguenots were French Protestants that were evicted from France and uh, uh, thrown out but were received by a number of cities around Europe. And they were brilliant uh, merchants and trade people. And Dublin welcomed them, and they came, and uh, a lot of their names are embedded in our street names. And they were very important for the development of the city. But this is one of the last burial grounds uh, we uh, feel in, in Europe. And it was terrific for us because uh, the previous building had no windows along here. And we uh, worked with the Huguenot Trust, and they gave us uh, permission to build a building which could uh, look out, in, excuse me, could look out into that space. And it allowed us to make an unusual kind of building in the city because we could have light from uh, four sides. In terms of plan, what we did was that we, uh, uh, in, in Georgian architecture, what's very uh, clever is that they have an entrance, but they make a void. So it means that you can connect a city, but you have essentially a bridge. It means that the void, you cross a bridge uh, from the city, but it also brings light down. So essentially the plan is a perimeter circulation. So you have like a cloister uh, on the edge and you have six uh, chimneys in the center where air is brought in and moved. And in section, you have the Huguenot Cemetery, uh, which is here. We carve the building down, we make a, a space with light from above, we have air coming in, we have the chimneys to the center. And chimneys in Dublin pay a huge, play a huge role in the streetscape. The, not only do we have roofs, but we have these chimneys that actually articulate the streetscape. So we wanted to make contemporary chimneys, but not in a, in a decorative way, that they would do a job of work. So they bring the air, the air is, com is coming in through the f uh, grills here, <coughs> in through the floor and up into the space, up through these chimneys. And essentially, the plan is perimeter uh, circulation with the offices, open uh, plan offices in the interior. And the only 
the problem for us as architects was that in the brief there was no ground room, there was nothing. But the, uh, so what we did was we took the staircase and used the staircase as the grand uh, space of the, of the project, the kind of collective space, and that it would do a number of things. One, it would be the big space. Two, it would uh, buffer. This is a busy road that by placing the main staircase here, it protects against the sound of the city, but also it's uh, the south sun, so it protects us against the, uh, uh, against the elements. So the staircase, here is the, uh, the Huguenot Cemetery uh, at a time when it, uh, the bluebells are in, uh, in bloom. And this is the, the project in its context, the wall containing the uh, cemetery on the left-hand side, the setback, the three-meter setback, which holds both the streetscape and the, uh, and the staircase above. So the way the project works is that we have a, a lower staircase here. It changes from the lower project and dances in this space with each of these windows facing and framing the city. So people, this is American bronze, uh, this uh, 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 gate, which is in the three meter depth. And we move, uh, this is for us, I suppose, the, this is a, tw a 20 millimeter uh, shadow gap and also these expansion joints. One of the issues that you'll deal with as architects, as, uh, as students, is that the conversations with your structural engineers are really very important early on. Because if they tell you something really important too late, <coughs> you discover that you have movement joints or expansion joints or sagging in concrete, and you haven't time to absorb them into the design. So have very early, I'm sure all the architects nodding their heads here know that there are things that engineers don't tell you in time and you want to strangle them individually. Yeah. But in order to not do that, uh, the interesting thing for us is that this, this is a six meter, you can hardly see it there, but stone, obviously facing south, will, have a, will need to move in a certain way, that some materials move more than others. It's just physics. But you need to know it architecturally, otherwise you have a kind of a crisis later on uh, in a project. This is a the staircase, it begins on street level and dances here and then moves into this space looking out over the city. So you have these framed views. This is the moving on the staircase. You have the city on the left hand side, the Balneslow limestone. And the limestone is slightly sanded, so it has a, um, a, a, a different kind of finish. It's this sandstone, or this limestone, is the lightest uh, limestone that we have in our country. And here we have the uh, the, the joints, the kind of engineering uh, joints which we've absorbed. We have uh, a 20 millimeter uh, eyebrow where we, where we need to make these, uh, these changes. And the issue of walls and the discussion and the choices that every uh, architect has about the expression uh, of a building, this is uh, the, the three meter cantilever of the space above. And the, the blocks of limestone are 100 millimeters high and they are 100 millimeters thick so they're they're actually weighty and the issue of gravity and connecting to the ground I mean the whole issue in modern architecture is really the separation between the structure and the skin and how do you actually uh, make uh, how do you give the sensation of weight and gravity or how do you give the sensation of lightness in this case we're saying that these are tons of stone we are in the heritage of a stone uh, building in the, in the city, and we want the architecture to, if you like, uh, uh, express, give that message in terms of the passerby. And this is the issue of the, of, the, of the limestone. So here we have the 100 millimeter of stone. I mean, somebody sands all of this surface, and the joint, the, the type of joint that holds it together, whether it is an unbelievably heavy thing, or whether it's recessed, the same, the same issue of, of the, the bricks uh, in this room. And when we were doing that project, we were in, uh, in Stockholm, and there's this amazing building which looks like a, a mountain. It's by an architect called Selsing. It's a bank. And what's amazing about it is that it feels like a, as if the quarry, as if the mountain has moved uh, to the city. And what we found absolutely uh, startling about this is the, the difference in finish of the stone, the actual detail around the window, the recess here, and the way that the windows themselves uh, are made. So here is a, an architect in Sweden taking a mountain 
and civilizing it, if you like, and placing it in the, in the heart of Stockholm. And one of the kind of, it's not so much a moral issue, but you as students or architects in the future, when you, when you build a building and when you use stone, you're actually carving out of the earth, making a big hole somewhere, and you're placing it somewhere else. So that translation from a natural condition to architectural uh, imagined space and surface brings with it a responsibility. You know, that you, it isn't, uh, this is sustainability, this is uh, geography being, being modified. So for us, uh, this cell thing was really, it's a powerful building, you know, it's kind of nearly frightening, it's, uh, it's so strong uh, as a building. And for us, this is the uh, side elevation onto the Hugo, Huguenot Cemetery. And the Huguenot Trust asked us only one thing. There's an old stone that was used in Dublin called Calp. But kelp is not used anymore. It's a, it's a black uh, stone which uh, is very brittle, so it's not mined anymore. But we chose, there are a number of limestones in Ireland, and the wall, uh, Huguenot Trust asked us to make the wall, which is connecting to the, uh, the cemetery, as dark as possible. So we chose the Kilkenny limestone, and then instead of sanding it, we burnt it, we flamed it off. So the surface of that is flamed, and when it rains, it really goes black. So mm -hmm. this was the nearest contemporary stone that we could get to the kelp. And the, then the stone of the main building is the Balnuslow limestone, which is our lightest one, which is a sand finish. And environmentally, just, just to describe this, that we have the wall, the stone wall, we have these uh, nostrils here, which brings the air through into the chimneys. And these are the, the metal mesh here. And this is recessed. This is a recessed window. And this... Uh, window slides completely away to form balconies out to the city. So when you're working here, you can see the balcony just in behind here. So in fact, we made a balcony to the Huguenot Cemetery looking out to St. Stephen's Green, and we made these flush windows. These were, uh, it's um, an amazing uh, window manufacturing company called GIG in Austria, and they made these um, uh, incredible um, uh, windows uh, with us. So this is the elevation, the kelp wall uh, here uh, with the dark Kilkenny limestone which is flamed and the elevation of the project uh, of the offices with the perimeter circulation. Two projects which we uh, have built in um, a university uh, of Limerick which is a city on the west coast uh, of Ireland and uh, we were asked to do two projects in fact, three or four in this little area, I'll show you two I'll only speak about uh, this afternoon, a medical school and residence uh, for, uh, for students. And um, Limerick is uh, a, the, a, a city which also has a Georgian grid. This is the main city uh, in, uh, of Limerick. Onto the, our main, our biggest river is a river called the Shannon. And this is uh, an aerial photograph of the Burren, which is this incredible landscape which is uh, really looks like something uh, on, on the moon. And the, this is the, 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 the campus. The campus has two parts. One is on uh, this side relating to the city and the new part of the campus which is in the area that leads off to the Burren, to those uh, limestone hills. And threaded through the campus is this wonderful uh, uh, river. This is the river Shannon which threads its way back up to the main core of the city. The, uh, we were asked to do a number of things uh, to connect to the existing uh, campus. Uh, there's a, a new bridge which was built, a number of other institutional buildings in the campus, and to build uh, or to contribute to building a new uh, a plaza, <coughs> a new school of medicine, a number of student housing, and a little building which is really uh, like a bus shelter which we propose to close the uh, enclosure of, of this, uh, this space. And these are study models where we're looking at the two uh, types of uh, functions, the, uh, the uh, School of Medicine and the uh, accommodation for the students, which is part of a, uh, if you like, a more organic um, uh, enclosure of the, of the campus. And here are the early sketches and drawings uh, describing the, the student. We, we broke the student accommodation into three uh, um, major houses. We twinned the, uh, the, the 
windows. Uh, so these are two uh, student living rooms uh, connected together to make a double scale. So we chose to use brick for the residential as a softer material. I mean, brick has a, a more intimate and kind of domestic uh, scale. There are rougher bricks than, than this. And we chose to use the limestone, the same limestone as in the project for the Department of Finance in Dublin, that we would use the same stone because the School of Medicine was a more civic building within the university campus. And also that would have this series of bending uh, walls that would allow students to be within the shadow and shade of the building, not only for sun, which we do get there, but also for the rain uh, for the west, for the west coast. So here are the two buildings together, the student residence here and the university uh, medical school. And looking at the, the way we designed the student accommodation, the accommodation, uh, as I said, is broken into three, uh, three buildings which sit organically on a sloping site. And sometimes there are routes for bicycles and connections from the buses down to uh, other areas of the campus. The, all the rooms, uh, the living rooms of the student accommodation face onto the public space. And as well as using brick, we took a little piece of the limestone. So this is a, a, a deep limestone uh, sill which forms the, uh, the, uh, the indent of the, uh, of the plan. So here we have uh, the uh, main plan of the student accommodation, uh, the circulation uh, lift, uh, lift and staircase to the void and looking into the common space, oh, sorry, their uh, shared uh, living rooms which are here and each student has a, a, an ensuite and sleeping and a study and a study room, uh, study area which views out. So that's facing uh, north uh, and this is facing south uh, to the campus. So we carved into the, into the space with the, deep, uh, with the deep stills. So here you have the, the, uh, the brick which is very uh, tactile, the recess with the limestone uh, sills and, uh, and, the, and the sunshine. And moving then to the, uh, that's a little glimpse, I'm not talking about it today, a little glimpse of the, like an amphitheater to wait to, uh, for forming the end of the space and a place to wait for the bus. We begin then to move into the colonnade of the, of the, um, of the medical school. And the, the it is a concrete frame and, uh, and stone cladding. And this is our uh, paper model studying the, 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 if you like, the benefit of, of the colonnade and changing the scale and proportion of, of windows as we move up uh, through the uh, building. So this is the building after a very heavy rain, so it means that you're protected, that the limestone changes color uh, in, in terms of the, the wet, uh, the moisture from the, from the Atlantic as you move in. And the section, excuse me, the section, the section is the thing, I suppose, that you have the option as an architect to bring light in, that a, that a space is really about how do you bring the, the natural light in as deep as possible. So what we have here is uh, the, the, the colonnade on the outside here. We have the space, the main circulation space, which gets its light from above. We have the um, uh, moving up through, uh, this is obviously a, a, a small uh, lecture hall, uh, some of the research moving up into into offices above but all the time trying to carve light deep into the into the plan and the the issue of uh, a window when a window is here and a window is above the coefficient of light you get more value for a piece of glass which is on the roof than you do on the surface because there's a sky factor and when in when you're at your environmental science lectures, you, you learn about the coefficient of, of light, but it, it is a, it's something that is, is for us uh, a very important thing. So you're entering in the, in, into the space, you move up through the building uh, on the staircase. And one of the things we find is that in buildings that if you put the, uh, the lifts or the elevators too soon, you don't, uh, you don't encourage people to use the staircase and to have some sort of social interaction that the staircase, like what's really lovely in this building here, is the half level. The half level is just enough to get you up, to separate you, but to connect you. And that the staircase, uh, w architects, we are not choreographers, but it's the nearest thing to being a choreographer, is to make the stairs. That the, they hide the elevators, 
make them impossible nearly to find, and make your staircases generous and interesting. And what's interesting in this building is that you arrive in and you move up to here, and there's a little kind of landing where you can stop before you move again. And there are staircases and there are lifts. I mean, there are elevators in the building. But by just positioning them slightly off, you get people to feel that it's an easy thing to do. So this, year, this is the landing. When you come to this position, you have a little ledge. You can stand and have a conversation. And the architecture is also a facilitator to, to slow down your, your life and to find social spaces where uh, it's easy to, to wait for your colleagues. Moving up through the section, with the daylight tumbling down and daylight in on the, on the surface, the concrete, uh, the concrete frame. So this is the, the public uh, space uh, formed by the three brick uh, student accommodation, by the, uh, the, the scale, if you like, of the, uh, of the School of Medicine. The final uh, project I'll discuss with you this afternoon is a project uh, that's just been completed in uh, Lima in Peru. We had uh, the inaugural, uh, there was an opening on the 30th of December where uh, UTEC uh, had uh, a fantastic um, event uh, uh, in the project. So they opened for students uh, this year. And people who have, uh, when we did this competition, we had never been to Peru. We had never uh, been to um, South America. I'd been to Mexico. Um, but uh, uh, Lima is a, a city of about uh, between 10 and 12 million people. It's essentially built on a desert. Uh, it has really no public tra transport, so traffic is unbelievable. Uh, the people are fantastic, and what is amazing is that it's on the Pacific. It is 12 degrees south <coughs> of the equator, which would normally make it very hot, but because there is a cold current coming up from Antarctica, uh, which keeps it at a certain temperature, it is always in the 20s, 20 degrees Celsius. So this is, uh, has a, had a historically a spontaneous culture of its own. It has amazing, probably the best food in the world. Uh, the people are fantastic. And we decided to do this competition, but we did not expect to win. Uh, luckily, in our uh, architectural practice in Grafton Architects was uh, an architect who had spent a month in Lima and her reports of how people live, how they are outside, how the inside outside is not the same. I'm sure if you sit outside this building on a cold winter night you want to go back in again. It doesn't happen in, in, uh, in Lima. Lima it's always just seems to be the kind of perfect place. Uh, in terms of temperature. So you have this, um, we have this amazing thing that we discovered about it, that it has the Pacific, yes, but it also has these incredible uh, cliffs, which are 40 meters. So you have the Pacific down here, and you have the city of Lima perched on these 40 meter cliffs uh, onto on the Pacific. And uh, it has the consequence of the hot connection to the equator and the cold current. So it has this fog. And uh, Milan also has fog. It's a city in the middle of a plain. But the, the fog here is very interesting. And fog, in this kind of uh, condition, uh, refracts light. It's very interesting that light is actually intensified by certain kinds of fog. And so much so that the back of your eyes, sometimes, you can actually feel the, the intensity of light. So this is the, the condition of Lima, the sea. The, the cliffs, and sometimes this fog, uh, which in Spanish they describe as the belly of, uh, of a donkey that's underneath, that the clouds are that kind of consistency uh, und underneath. So for us, we began the competition, going back to the sketches, to the <coughs> kind of DNA, the embryo of a project, and they, they needed the, the, a new university on an unusual site and the need, the actual schedule of, of requirements were big laboratories for engineering, medium-sized laboratories, classrooms, uh, smaller rooms, smaller rooms. So for us, we began thinking about uh, how we would put these together in terms of uh, a new campus that would be built in three uh, phases in this city that we did not know. And these sketches 
describe the, uh, the Pacific Ocean, the waves here, the, the actual cliff uh, in this position, in a valley that we, the site was on a valley uh, in from the sea that had on one side unbelievably busy motorway and on the other side a very beautiful 19th century part of Lima called Barranco. So we had two conditions. On the outside, very busy, facing uh, north, busy traffic, and on the other side, uh, uh, it's uh, domestic. Uh, and this, was, this, is, this small sketch is the beginning of a project that now people are moving into. And it's, it's incredible as, uh, as architects, the power that you actually have in terms of making the world. People have requests and dreams, and you as architects then have to invent a world. So the, the profession you're studying is incredible. It's not just making a book or writing Ulysses or something, not just a book. It's a space in which people's lives will happen in the future. So we're always amazed that something as tiny as this can become as big as, as a building. It's an amazing process. So here we have the busy road, we have the, the heavy shoulder on one side, and the cascading building, cascading because of the functional big rooms, smaller rooms, smaller rooms stacked on one another. And each of those rooms then had the potential to be the, um, the, the, the roof garden uh, below. And it also meant that in section, that the rooms as they cantilevered over one another could protect you from the, from, from the sun. So this drawing uh, is the project. This is saying you have the busy motorway, you have the uh, bigger rooms down below, you move uh, through the project, the roofs of the, the pieces uh, below have the potential to be in gardens, and that you, you make a building. I mean, when, you, when you're, this is seismic. Uh, um, Lima is very seismic. And it's interesting, if you kind of stand like this, you can feel the muscles in the back of your legs. You're kind of anchoring yourself. And when we had done this sketch, and then as we worked with the structural engineers for the competition, this form is actually very good in terms of uh, seismic uh, um, um, stability. So it's just interesting in terms, this is a charcoal sketch. And this morning, being in the, in the first year studio where the students were learning with pencil, I it's really what happens is that this is where the mind is free, you're judging scale, but it's also a, a very powerful tool, the little stick of, uh, of charcoal. So moving in terms of uh, your kind of architectural heritage, when you look around uh, and see, these are uh, architectural spaces and structures made by unbelievably uh, powerful architects in South America. And we had, we had been looking at these incredible pieces and watching that space uh, flow in and out of, of, of these spaces. And we, uh, this is a, a, a stadium, a football stadium by Mendes de Rocha. And we, uh, we were asked to participate in the Venice Biennale of 2012. And the theme was uh, common ground. And we had just won the UTEC uh, project and we wanted to, if you like, uh, display our uh, respect for South American architects and also our first project in South America together. And we, there were no drawings of this uh, uh, project in, in existence, uh, and so we redrew the, this project and worked uh, to, to make models and study models, which we presented in uh, Venice in 2012. But it wasn't so much the football, although I'm sure the football is very important, uh, it was more the possibility of the uh, socializing of the undercroft, the power of the under, of the space beneath to uh, allow for casual uh, interaction. So for us, when we were doing UTEC, we also asked the question, uh, why can't a, uh, a university be an arena for learning? So we took the typology of the, the, uh, uh, of the stadium and said, why can't we use the section and relate the uh, social quality of the undercroft? Why can't we cascade and relate to Barranco or, or to, uh, to Lima? And why can't we use this kind of scale of structure in a climate that allows you to have inside outside where you don't need corridors, you don't need to seal uh, a building? So these are our, uh, first these are paper models. Uh, one is to uh, a thousand and one is to 500. And here we're studying 
the, uh, the way of being able to control uh, the, uh, the motorway and to begin to build uh, the structure. In Bocconi, our structure is every 25 meters. In this case, because of the size of the laboratories, a 20 meter uh, span with an intermediate 10 meter span became more uh, suitable both for their uh, evacuation distances and also the sizes of the, of the laboratories. So here we have our sketch paper model showing the uh, busy uh, road here, the cascading uh, uh, surfaces as they move down towards Boranca here. And we, we find the paper model, the kind of sketch paper uh, model, allows us to uh, investigate. Uh, it's, it's like a three-dimensional sketch as opposed to a, 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 a drawing. And this, this drawing was part of the competition where we're taking the, the, uh, the heaviness of the, the motorway, the 20-meter pieces, the intermediate 10-meter, and the fog. This was done by uh, uh, Joanne Lyons, who's the architect who had spent the month in Lima. And as the drawing was being prepared, and she was um, you know, uh, whitening out the upper part, it was very interesting. This is what happens. The project kind of connects uh, to the sky. And going back to the 40-meter uh, high cliffs, this is a, a sample of, of the cliffs. And we're saying that we're making this project, which, when it's finished, will be 360 meters long. Uh, in the fabric of the city of, of Lima, and that we would take uh, our uh, inspiration from the uh, from the color and the substance of the of the cliffs. But what will happen? As I said, uh, the, the the city of Lima is on a is on a desert, and they have uh, the, the winds, the little dust forms, uh, will be on the building. So over time, a lot of the the surface of the desert will be on the surface uh, of the building. Here is from the competition where we have the cascading uh, uh, rooms down to Barranco. The image looking out over, this is the library. This is a proposition for the library with these views. And also in Machu Picchu and in the Inca terraces, the fantastic uh, gardens. They make these little places where every, every piece of landscape is uh, irrigated and uh, 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 places for the crops to grow. And this section, is the competition section, the heavy pieces below, the aulas, the uh, laboratories, classrooms moving up in terms of section. So this is uh, our, uh, our initial uh, proposition. And the seismic forces in terms of the, of the, uh, the, um, the location, uh, this is at the competition stage. So we're really uh, trying to anchor the building and to <coughs> correspond to hopefully never experienced, but always <laughs> potential uh, seismic uh, movement. And in terms of plan, we uh, have the busy motorway, as we said, the quieter entrance, which is into here, into the heart of the project, and you move. This is, these are the phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three, and phase one has just been uh, completed. And these are the images of the, uh, the relationship to the Pacific Ocean, that, that the open spaces would become the places where students uh, interact and could uh, re relate to one another. And this kind of postcard that we made during the competition is kind of a 1950s uh, postcard of the, the power of, of a structure for a, a university of engineering that, that it could actually uh, explain itself to be an engineering uh, uh, um, research place. And this drawing is really uh, kind of emotionally and important for us uh, socially, that you have the city, that you have the big laboratories being able to be uh, viewed, that laboratories are not buried and <coughs> stuffed. Like the Bocconi project, we didn't want to put them into the basement. We wanted students, if you were studying some other, a bit like your university here, I mean, this building is really very uh, uh, legible in terms of if you're in first year, you can see what's happening in, uh, in fifth year. As a school of architecture, it really is a very clear diagram and works extremely well. Even as a stranger, as I walk along the corridors, you get that sense of community and you can see what's going on. These are decisions by the architect and these are decisions that we're making that professors up here see students arriving. You might see something that catches your eye. You might even change the direction of your research by virtue of something you happen to see. And these are uh, drawings that are uh, computer uh, images that the client prepared during the, uh, during the development where we have these uh, staircases and small gardens and overhanging. So because the sun is so high and the 12 degrees uh, from the south, 
uh, you, you need protection from, the, uh, from direct sunlight. So these are views, uh, potential views uh, of the project. And this is an important image for us, going back to La Jolla and going back to the Salk Institute. These are the spaces that are not normally, you don't, it's not the first image of the, the, the space by Lewis Kahn. And here, uh, that, oh sorry, that space is to the left uh, that you normally see out here, the one relating to the ocean. But these are the spaces, the crafted spaces uh, to the side, and they're very beautiful, and they also have a fantastic, the Californian sun is really uh, very, very strong. And I'll just quickly bring you through the, these sections. Essentially, these are the, the walls. Um, uh, here, I'll just show you what they've done in terms of, we have uh, major structure and minor structure, uh, the aula. There's a separation in this one here. What we've done is, with the local uh, structural engineer, the, uh, this level here is completely anchored into the earth, which is here. And then the upper building is held on these uh, seismic isolators. So the upper part of the building is completely uh, separated. Um, so in the event of, uh, of seismic movement, that uh, this part of the building uh, is, is separated completely from the lower, from the lower level. And these are a series of cuts. What is interesting for us is that because the plan is going to be 360 meters, each 20 meters there's a diff different shift. So you get uh, different uh, readings of the, of the structure. And the building began and they built it at enormous speed. There's no delays in South America. Uh, they had uh, three cranes, each crane with 300 men and though, so there was a thousand men working on the site. It was amazing uh, to watch. It was like the building of a medieval cathedral because so many people were, were on, on board. And then you see the beginning of the interior, the main, the main structure, uh, the intermediate beams, the, uh, uh, these ones here, which were, uh, you can see the divide of the shutters. So you begin, you begin to see the, the scale. This is when you enter, you're, you've come in through the entrance, you come up a main stairs, onto various levels and you move up through, through the spaces. So you have this um, major and minor uh, structure. You have spaces which uh, link across. You have uh, light tumbling down uh, in uh, on the surfaces. You view down, these are the workmen in their orange uh, protective uh, gear. The staircases leading you up into uh, uh, the various levels the framing of uh, Lima itself, so each student becomes aware of where they are, that the issue of being in a, we could have made kind of an office block with an elevator and you go up, you go into your rooms, but we wanted that students coming from all parts of Peru would be proud of the fact that they connected to the Pacific and viewed uh, their city. So that's the, the view up to the Pacific. But what the other environmental, I mean, there's, when we talk about cultural environmental uh, uh, continuity, there's a breeze that comes in from, the, uh, from this uh, beautiful ocean and threads its way through the, through the project so that you get, uh, if you like, a, a very gentle breeze in the spaces. So it's like a, it's like a ship. It's like the, the building catches the, the air as it comes from, from the ocean. So here's the uh, frame on the, so the upper level will be a common garden and they will be uh, uh, with views over the city. And in terms of the, the, the wall uh, to, the, to the motorway, this is the separation, the seismic separation. This wall is made of two layers, one with precast uh, on the inside, which is permanent shuttering. And then they, uh, w we developed with them uh, uh, in situ uh, uh, triangles of of concrete. I mean, they have achieved, it's been fantastic to work with the concrete uh, manufacturers and, uh, to make, so this is a, the, the, if you like, the, the every 20 meters we have these, this is the cap which holds it and protects it. So this is the, the, the sky as you go through. So this is this folded wall and the expansion joints. So don't forget them, I don't know what the Spanish for expansion joints and movement joints, uh, but the, they're just important to, to learn. And one of the things that we have found that sometimes some of the geometries you could never have imagined. This is on the inside of the folded wall to the motorway. And you get this crack of light within, within this space. And, and we find that, that sometimes 
uh, there's a complete surprise and joy about making a, a, a space that has this consequence by, uh, by accident, really. So here we have the project uh, in uh, with its wall, um, its relationship to Bianca to the west. The, the piece, this is its prow uh, relating to the, um, to the Pacific. Uh, its sunlight, you can see the angle of the sun uh, and uh, the, the shadow that it, it provides, uh, the staircase leading to the entrance, uh, from the entrance level. And just in terms of, of completion, uh, there's, uh, there's a nice uh, quote from uh, Annette Guijon and Mike Gear that architecture is material, permanently joined, layered, and poured, and pieced together around space. So for us, uh, the stone, the quality of earthiness, and the sphere fen quality of very thin concrete held to hold light uh, are important references. So thank you very much. Thank you.